Life is full of twists and turns and important decisions that we have to make. You almost became a personal trainer in Fairhaven in Bellingham, Washington. What would that Sam Ocean have looked like besides way more jacked? Oh, I was about to say he would look a lot more jacked, but man, what a what a brilliant question. You're the only one who I think knows that about me. Man, that Sam Ocean would be so different than the Sam Ocean I am now. Now, admittedly, maybe that Sam Ocean might even be a little bit happy or he'd you know, find some fulfillment, some little things in his day-to-day -day life. But, and there's nothing wrong with that path. <clears throat> it's admirable, it's honorable. Like a lot of people choose it and they're doing just fine. But that Sam Ocean, he, that path would have been a little bit too small for him. The, the dreams I had back then and the things I wanted to do were just bigger than what that vision was. But back then, that's all I knew existed. You choose one of these kind of traditional paths and you go for it. So all I've ever wanted to do was to live an exciting life, tell very awesome stories at the bar, and hopefully just inspire some people with those stories. And so that's the Sam Ocean I have chosen to become today, which is just a far deviation from what I was thinking years ago. Yeah, we all kind of have that choice to make. Uh, I know for me, it was my parents pushing me in a certain direction. And it really only felt like one choice was like, go to college, get a job. I didn't even realize there was another path. Um, and I know for you, you know, there's some things you can't control, especially with your parents. Your mom was 16 years old, came over from India and put you up for adoption. And I just wonder, like, I know that's a heavy subject for some people. And I wonder if that's impacted you and your why at all, or if that's just kind of a footnote in the Sam Ocean story. Oh, man, such a, such a beautiful question. To start with the end in mind, I would call it a footnote that at certain moments, depending on the day and the time and what I'm thinking, turns into something much bigger for a flash. <clears throat> so I, I always started with this. If you've seen that movie, Slumdog Millionaire, right? A lot of people have, but for some reason when I talk to someone, they haven't. My, my birth mom pretty much went through that. She was kind of like in the slums. She was, uh, she was abandoned as a kid, so she got put up into an orphan home in India over there with a, a ton of other kids, right? Uh, an American lady flew from the USA to go travel and she traveled around that area, just happened to walk into that orphan home. And she just, she that's when she had that moment for her. She just felt like she wanted to make a difference. She wanted to help these kids, but she could only help one. She happened to adopt one of those kids. It happened to be my birth mom, flew her to the USA, raised her. At 16, she got knocked up and she had me but she knew she was too young to raise me so she put me up for adoption too now it's not it, it's not a touchy subject for me because it was a planned adoption so we knew who the parents were going to be the the like the week before i was born those parents backed out and the parents i have today were the second in line for that so i've seen my birth mom once a year ever since and i grew up in a, a great family they took great care of me and I always think I was like one generation away. I was one decision away from like not growing up in USA, not having these opportunities and being a completely different person and situation. So I do think about that and I do feel blessed for what I have now. Yeah, that's there are a lot of people that don't have, you know, stable homes like us. They don't have uh, great opportunities to kind of understand what a good dynamic is in, in the home. And, and that really, I think, helps helped me a lot. Um, kind of look at the world in a certain light and not feel like certain pressures. Um, and not, but even so, like you still have to go out in the market and do things on your own. And um, nothing's really given to you in life once you start, once you reach a certain age, uh, except for you, I guess there was in, uh, in college, you got that A plus on that, that piece of art that you made that was terrible. <laughs> and it kind of like, you know, you question, helped you question a little bit, like, what am I doing here? Is this really like a representation of the real world and am I going to benefit from this? And so I'm curious, like, can you talk a little bit about the meritocracy of social media and creating content there and, and how you can really cut through and it's based on, you know, the actual quality of the work? Definitely, man. It, it was so that, that story that you bring that up is so funny because I'm terrible at art. I, I draw this like egg. It didn't even look like an egg. And the teacher gave me an A plus for trying. I'm like, that's so nice. But like, I 
don't do, like what, what grit and that grade's going to get me into the next step. I'm like, I, it wasn't really for me. And so I, it's funny after that, I instantly got into content creation and <clears throat> I just knew from an early age back then, this is like, man, this is 20, uh, what is it? 13. So we didn't have these people who are personal brand gurus or how to courses, or you got to create content like this. If you want to get followers, there wasn't any of that stuff. There wasn't these courses or coaching or masterminds teaching us how to do these things. All we had were people sharing their passions and their interests back then. And it was just known that, um, you go do some cool stuff in life and you carry a camera with you and you like talk about it and you vlog about it. Casey Neistat, he was like the original, uh, the original gangster with this stuff. He made the video blog popular. And so I just got straight into that. And I just kind of knew from an early age that the number one, like the number one way to kind of start creating content and to even stand out is to just go, go give yourself an exciting journey to go on and share that journey. And so, man, I just bought a camera, opened up a YouTube channel and started going. That was fun. So you had that in front of the camera experience, but also I know a lot of your business experience, you kind of been the man behind the man or like this, the scooter brawn behind the Justin Bieber, right? I heard you say, I want to be the guy in the crowd that everyone on stage knows about. And I think exactly. that's a really cool way to frame it. What was so appealing about stepping into that role in business? So that stepping into that role happened because of the pain point of being in front of the camera, which is when I opened that YouTube channel, Greg, I recorded, must have done, I don't know, 200 videos. I lost track. Over the course of five years, I had a whopping 500 YouTube subscribers. I kind of posted into the void, as they call it, for like five years. And I just had this real moment with myself. I was, sit I was sitting on a beach in the Philippines, right, with barely any money, vlogging about this stuff. And I just realized, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit superficial. I'm spending so much time talking about stuff. I'm not actually like truly doing something or building something amazing. And I looked at the people in my life and like the ones who are building, they're not the ones kind of like in front of the camera. They're these guys kind of behind the scenes, building these skills, making these uh, connections with other people and creating something epic, usually in the form of a business. So I just, it was one of my life experiments where it's like, okay, I'm gonna put the camera down I'm going to go incognito and I'm just going to go behind the scenes and become as effective as possible. So that's where I learned business skills. That's where I learned about marketing, copywriting, all of these things I know. That's where I started to network and meet some bigger players above me. And over the course of what was nearly a decade, um, I learned how to take my skills and create money out of thin air. With that, since I feel stable in that, it has now brought me back to wanting to come and uh, you know be in front of the camera and start to share some of this stuff because I feel like I just went on a hero's journey and this next time around it's like I'm bringing the camera back because I you know I've learned how to wield the sword and use it to kind of slay the dragon and I just want to show other people the same thing. I want to talk about that because one of the guys that you helped a lot and worked closely with with is Digital Jeff and uh, you recently parted ways uh, and you know you like you said you're used to kind of coming in and maintaining and optimizing these creators at the success level that they're at. But now you're the man, right? You are the man, you're putting yourself back out in front. How are you approaching this new chapter in your journey? Yeah, I what I have just historically done is I find the faces, I find the personal brands who have the audience, have the attention, and I make them a deal. I say, hey, you're really good at this. I'm really good at what I do. I'll do the marketing, the sales, the operations, so you don't have to. All you have to do is keep creating your content, keep being famous, and keep making people happy, and I'll build the machine behind you uh, to, to capture everything you do. So that's been the pitch that just works over and over and over. Building those machines really helps create leverage, and I just realized if I were to partner with myself and I made myself that same deal, I think I can actually achieve this I never did it before because I just, I always knew how to go find really big people who had big audiences and were sitting on just gold mines of cash within 30 days. I don't have those giant audiences, but I'm like, it would be an exciting adventure to put my money where my mouth is and quite literally turn myself into a case study. So I have pitched myself, Greg, that same deal that I go pitch all these other people. And I'm making myself as the face as I build the machine uh, behind the scenes. And so that's, 
that's been, I don't want to call it a learning curve, but whatever a learning curve is like internally where you're growing and getting over some resistance, that's what it's been the last 30 days. Just stepping outside of myself and really consulting myself on how to go do this and getting out of my own way. That's, that's what this whole thing's been. And I'm excited about what's next. I have no doubt you're going to pull it off, but that requires a lot of work. Now you're kind of working behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. Are you building a team to help you do this or are you taking it on by yourself? I will eventually build a team as one always does. And I've done that before under, you know, client budgets and even previous businesses I've had. Mike, the way I'm going to do this is <clears throat> over what I've, the skills I've learned over the last decade, almost a decade, it wasn't just how to do things, but it was how to think. Right. And it's so it's this idea of a lot of this game is about solving problems. It's about knowing which step to take. One of my favorite quotes is the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. But what if you're going in the wrong direction? I have learned how to take the right next step. And that always comes down to what is the fastest path to cash? What is the the levers you can pull that are cash, you know, it generates cash flow, it's revenue generating activities, cut out everything else because when you're from a position of cash flow and you have that revenue coming in and you can actually start to direct it towards hiring people, um, you know, buying these softwares or whatever you want to do, taking profit for yourself. So the the zero to one stage is very doable with just one person. And I, I actually am starting to realize, I think everyone should do the zero to one by themselves. Um, it just gives you so much more leverage when you go from one to 10, which is bringing in other people. So that's my plan. It's going to be make an offer, find the audience, connect the two with marketing, and then do that up to a certain revenue checkpoint and then bring someone in. It's also really beneficial. It's empowering. First of all, when you can take yourself, uh, from zero to one and you just like, okay, I did that. But it requires along the way to build a lot of skills too that you may not have had to kind of fill in the blanks. You don't even, it's kind of like you don't know what you don't know until you just get in there. And 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 so it's a really vital process. I agree with you to kind of do that by yourself for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm experiencing that now. I'm starting to bring on a couple people to like take some of the back end away from me, but only because I've been able to do the initial part. And to your point has built like you know, a bit of a reputation and audience because I was able to be like a one man show for a little bit. So that's super cool. And I know that you also had like, um, you have like some direct response sales background. Um, I, I don't know if you know this about me, but I worked my first job for three and a half years was at an as seen on TV company where I helped, uh, work with vendors to like set up different websites for, you know, those different infomercials late at night and stuff like that. So past life, but I'm, you know, that was literally called the direct response industry. It was like super DR. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what direct response is and, and your role in it? And then also more importantly, like how do you balance direct response sales with building brand? Ooh. So first of all, Greg, I'm so proud of you for what you've been doing. I love to hear that you're bringing in other people, what you have, it's going to fly through zero to one, one to 10, one to a hundred. And so the second thing is I am fascinated to know that was your background in our industry. I'll get to the definition soon. It's funny. You started there and now you've moved away. A lot of the biggest people in our space, they'll actually like go online and then they'll try to get back to the infomercial just because as you know, it can pull in a lot of money. So the direct response, the simplest definition is it's a style of marketing where you, whoever is reading it. So if there's a prospect or a viewer watching your video or they're reading your post by like the end of the post or the video, you ask them to do something else. You don't just end the video. You say, Hey, go click on this thing or go do this thing or go leave a comment. You give them a next step to take and a good direct response marketer will successfully influence the person to take the step. And so that's what it's about. The whole point of direct response is each thing, each asset, each website or you know email you create, you tell them where to go next and you just keep telling them to go closer and closer and closer to eventually buying your product. That's like the ultimate thing. When you tell them, hey, buy this product and they buy it. That's what direct response marketing is. So I can go into uh, how you balance direct response with brand. The reason that's even like a question in our space is because direct response marketing is great to go from zero to one. It is a, it is a way to think about generating cash flow today, which I think is probably the number one priority for any business. The 
with brand, brand doesn't have that element of like telling people what to do. Brand is more of like a feeling you give to the audience. And so when they log off Twitter or they get off social media and they're just taking a walk in the park, they're still thinking about you. They're still feeling what, what they felt when they watched your video. Like that effect is brand. It's much more intangible. It's harder to control. It's something done on a longer time horizon. And there's not really a brand strategy you can implement in the next 30 days to go get sales, but there is a direct response strategy you can implement in the next 30 days to go get sales. So typically you start DR and then you start to transition into brand. Most people get stuck because they start DR and they stay in DR, AKA direct response. Do that too long, you kind of create your own little hamster wheel and you never end up creating that brand effect that audiences truly love. Um, the unicorn examples, Apple, Amazon, whatever it is, you can have that for yourself on whatever whatever level you are. It just requires a different strategy. So that's kind of like the key differences between the two. Yeah. And it feels like there would be a lot of pressure to kind of always be in DR because it's like, how do we like, not for lack of a better term, like manipulate, you know, the click or the buy. And it's like, how do we get them? And it's like, at some point that probably becomes just so stressful and overwhelming to always be thinking about how to push someone forward through the funnel in some sense. Whereas with brand, you can almost just be yourself and, and things start to grow organically. And there's something like uh, cathartic about that and just therapeutic and fun and sustainable. And that's something that I've experienced on X has been able to like the meta right now is telling these stories and opening up and being more yourself. And that's really working. You're almost at 10K now on X. You have, you know, history of Facebook marketing, you know, YouTube channel, as you mentioned. You've been on a lot of these different platforms. How do you rank these different social medias right now? If you were just getting started, if you're in the middle, like like what do you think they each bring? Um, you don't have to go one by one, but kind of where's your head at in terms of rank ordering them? For sure. I'm incredibly biased, but because I've just seen so much behind it. And uh, I'll give a little context to this. To your point, you said before, it seems like staying in that direct response zone would start to get stressful. <clears throat> it does. So I've worked with about seven, like I've worked deeply with about 17 different companies that were doing about $100,000 a month or more. And that was the minimum baseline. About 15 of them used direct response and they stayed in direct response. The issue with that is, again, you create this hamster wheel, it can get stressful. You're usually using paid advertising. So your expenses go higher, your profit goes lower. And for anyone who doesn't understand paid advertising, think of it like an algorithm. And just like how the alg algorithms can start to change no matter what platform you're on, <clears throat> the same thing happens with ads. And if your whole business is dependent on that, then when the algorithm changes, your entire revenue could tank, not just your views and impressions, but your actual sales. So there was two companies that were the highest profit, the easiest to run, the least stressful, and both of them shifted away from direct response and they were leveraging brand. Now, the cleanest example I can give, direct response is when you tell someone to buy your product. Brand is when someone asks you where they can buy your product. It, you know, it's an interesting distinction I just made right now. The platform I am the most fan of is YouTube. Now, I think this is kind of like a generally agreed upon thing. Um, there's such a nuanced conversation, but hypothetically, if you were to start all social media platforms today with the perfect strategy, all the stars aligned and everything was going good for you. And then five years into the future, you have all platforms and they're maximized with all their subscribers and followers and content. The platform that would probably be your number one kind of needle mover and just stability in the business would tend to be YouTube. It is the only platform that is truly like search engine optimization based. It's like true organic where when you post, so I love Twitter, right? I love X. When you post a tweet, it will like live for a day or two and then it just dies into the ecosystem and you have to make another piece of content and another piece of content. <clears throat> With YouTube, when you do it right, you make a video and it, it just, it doesn't die. It just, it starts to come alive and it will start, YouTube will feed that video to people over months and even over years. So there's a big compounding effect with that. And I've seen it firsthand with how it can help you generate sales and profitably. And the customers are just better because they've been watching long form YouTube videos for weeks, months, even years. Um, that, that's the kind of business I want to build. It's just hard to start with YouTube. Yeah, I, I think that's really well said across the board. If you could just snap your fingers and be an influencer, for lack of a better term, on any platform, 
YouTube is going to be the most powerful because you have the video element. It's television, right? It's it's TV. Uh, it, it is on demand TV, and so. Uh, and you have full flexibility, no producers, no red tape. You post anything you want and you make that really deep connection. Like you said, it's harder to get started. It's it's less of a high leverage social media because with X, you can just post a tweet and it can get millions of views. YouTube, you really have to put in a lot of effort, many hours to put up a video that's going to get a lot of views. Uh, and so I like the analogy you made with kind of just the falling off and then the continuing to grow. Like I'll still sometimes get videos from six years ago. They'll just pump it back up and it'll go reviral based on what's happening organically in search. Right. And, and, and what you have kind of behind that. Um, but I do think the high leverage nature of X is really interesting and you still can build some sort of connection with people, particularly with spaces, which obviously I'm quite bullish on. And you have started to begin your spaces strategy. So it seems you've had uh, two spaces over the last couple of weeks that you've done solo, where you basically do these presentations that you spend a lot of time on and you offer people actionable advice. The two spaces have gotten over 3000 plays together, which is incredible, uh, particularly for a solo uh, you know, presentation. Normally it's a bunch of people on stage or an interview, but it's been pretty much just you. Uh, the authority building that that leads to is incredible. So I'm curious, kind of like, what your spaces strategy is right now, how you're approaching that and what you're excited about. Perfect. Well, step number one in my space strategy was finally decide to do it after seeing Greg crush it. Uh, you have definitely inspired me wanting to start those because I, when I attend your spaces, I feel the effect it has. Um, and I'm like, I would love to go do that too. It's not an easy thing to get into internally, because I know a lot of people get nervous and they get anxious or they're speaking and I, the spotlight's on you. Welcome to being a creator. Welcome to being an influencer. That is like the minimum barrier to entry and you will learn so many skills. So strategically, I use spaces for a couple things. One, there are, there are products and offers and methodologies that are floating around in my head, but they're not formulated. They're not structured. They're not organized. And I need to give myself the time and the space to do it. And I'm like, instead of just sitting down one day, turning off my social media, my phone, and like, you know, writing this on a paper or a Google document, I'm like, how can I kind of almost build this in real time, almost build this in public? How can I build my products and offers in public? So I decided to use spaces as my vehicle to do so. So every space I do is a methodology or something that I eventually want to productize and start to put it into an asset that can either sell for money or just give it away for free. So that's number one. That's the strategy number one. It's a forcing function is what we call it. I'm forced to go make those things. And it, there's other beneficial, uh, there's other ways it starts to benefit me by you know giving it to an audience, getting more followers, building authority. Number two, um, my, my strategy has been, an, it's almost like an experimentation. So from my direct response marketing days, I've learned so much about what effective marketing looks like and how you can use this to go build your brand and build your business. So I use spaces as a platform to like take my wild theories and start to play with them. Um, for example, I've, I know call to actions are important. And so in the spaces I've been experimenting with, can I make a call to action to have people retweet the space? What do I have to do to get everyone here to retweet the space? I work backwards from there. I'm like, okay, I'll deliver value, but I need to make some very appealing offer. So I'll make an offer and I'm like, I'll give it to you for free if you retweet this. And then boom, the retweets go up. I'm like, okay, cool, successful experiment. Can I repeat it? So I do it again and I do it again. And then at some point it might be, hey, you want this thing? Go do this other thing. So strategy number two is just to always be a practitioner of marketing. Um, will I do spaces forever? I'll do them for a long time. I still get nervous thinking about them. I have one coming up this week and I got to figure out the topic, right? But that's kind of what makes this game fun. Yeah, it's it's cool. I love this idea of kind of forcing yourself to go through your thoughts in real time. And it's one of the benefits of writing and that sh is shared with speaking, right? Is it's, you have these things in your head, you think you know what you think and you think you know what you, be what you believe until you're forced to put it into words, whether written or spoken, that other people can intake, that you can deliver it in a package that other people can learn from. And so that, that forcing of yourself to kind of understand your own ideas so that you can communicate them efficiently 
is an incredible, uh, incredible process to go through to figure out where you stand. And like you said, even just develop these ideas in real time, because as you do that, you start to piece things together uh, and you realize, oh, that that is what I think. OK, oh, actually, that's a good idea. Um, plus, you're giving away the value of that idea. And so it's like this amazing double whammy. Uh, and the other thing that I found that spaces are incredible at is kind of this networking, right? And being able to meet new people in a human way on a social platform, which is really difficult. Not many socials can you do that on, unless you're literally like with YouTube or something like going to them physically and collabing. Uh, I guess you could do like some sort of Zoom call like this. But when you're in a group environment and you're talking to a crowd, it, it adds an extra element of connectivity when you actually hit it off with somebody. How have you found spaces and x as a networking tool how are you using that and and the different ways you've been meeting new people hearing you talk about spaces just gets me even more excited to do it because i'm starting to piece together just how it's it's like more than a double whammy it's a triple whammy a quadruple ram there's so many tangible benefits outside of it so networking i think has been a huge one and so what i've found with with x and this is a little bit above spaces is it's been the ultimate networking tool for me. I don't know what it is. I come from the world of Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, YouTube, YouTube networking is non-existent. Facebook, Instagram, it's like more so probably Facebook messenger is the easiest one, but to send a DM to someone on X versus to send a message to someone on Facebook, Facebook, the distance just feels further, right? Something about X, it feels like I'm sending a message to someone who's standing right next to me, the, the, the access like there, there's almost no barrier to entry or barrier between you and the other person. And I know that's literally what it is for every other platform, but like something's different with this one. It's almost the context of it is this idea of that. You're just kind of expressing your thoughts. It's really a zero to one platform. In my opinion, it makes getting your ideas out there so easy, so accessible. It seems like it can be a little bit less polished. I know in our circle, we can make things look really nice, but you get direct access to people's ideas on a daily basis, which is your in to message someone or to start a conversation with someone. They're literally putting out these hooks every day that you can latch onto to start those conversations. So my strategy for networking has been interesting. My content isn't catered to like my ideal audience per se, right? My content is designed for maximum influence. So I'm sharing what I'm doing, just sharing ideas and philosophies. Whoever it hits with, cool. Behind the scenes is where I start to do my networking through the DMs. And I use my personal brand to let those people I want to network with see how I'm doing it. They see that I'm growing. They see that I'm making an impact. They might not read my post, but they hear about this Sam guy or they notice that I did a space that people started to talk about. So when I go to start that DM, uh, they know who I am already or they're DMing me. Yeah, I was on... Uh... Who was it yesterday? I was on a, oh, I went to uh, go see Nick Verge. We hung out in person. We went to go do a uh, sauna and cold plunge. And we were talking about the space we did the other day with Virgil and Eddie and Taylor and me and you. And he was like, I love spaces. He was like, I took the most away from Sam. He was like, he just absolutely killed it in there. Uh, and so it's the power of the voice. And me and you have this little running joke. I had sent you a voice note months ago when it first came out. And for whatever reason, you know, you're in Mexico, they hadn't released the feature. So I'm curious, you say you go into the DMs after you put out this content. Are you using voice notes at all these days? Is that part of your strategy? Oh man, the moment they, I was so envious because I don't know why I never got it, but you had sent me a voice note and I had promised because you got me into it and I promised, Greg, I'm saving my first voice note to you the moment Musk allows me to do it. Dude, all I had to do was update Twitter. And then I finally got the DM or the voice note access. So I sent you the first voice note and now <clears throat> voice note is pretty much all I send, especially when I want to make an impression, you know, making like one, it's much easier for me to speak rather than like to try and type it out, my editing brain starts to like reword things. So when I just speak, I free flow. So it's been easier. The barrier to entry in terms of messaging someone is easier with voice notes, in my opinion. I know that's not the case for other people because they're kind of nervous with maybe their accent or how they sound. Um, you know, that stuff I think is a little bit less important than what we might realize. But all I do now when I network is I, I, I initiate the DM um, and it's always personalized and it's, man, it's, I don't want to call it a power move. It's just been hyper effective. 
It is a power move, Bo, um, because, and the good thing, me and you, we don't mind speaking. We actually enjoy and prefer speaking. So it plays right into our wheelhouse. But when you receive it, you know, if it's well-spoken, you don't want it dragging on. If it's your first message to someone, you don't want it to be two minutes. Like, even if it's valuable, uh, you want to kind of get right to the point. But what you do is you establish authority, you show confidence, you portray a lot of like unspoken things under the surface that you can't really do in a text message, or it would at least at, at least take 30 minutes to craft the perfect message, you know, and I've been stuck in those loops. So voice notes are super powerful for that. Um, I absolutely love them. And I know also, you know, your girlfriend is a classical piano player and she loves what she does. Um, how important is it being around that, like seeing somebody that loves what they do, how important is it for you and for other people to find something that they're really passionate about, particularly from a sustainability standpoint? Oh man, there's, there's so many ways to answer this, but in my simple brain, I look at it in two things. There is like business and then there is life. Okay. There's that, there's that big question that holds a lot of pressure, which is like, if money weren't an issue, what would you do with your life? That's so hard for people to answer because it's a hypothetical that will probably never happen, but what would you do? So for me, I'm not, I admit this, I'm not passionate about business. I do enjoy it. I find the things that get me excited about it. The process of doing it and uh, experimenting and seeing things work, right? When you shoot the basketball and you hear that swish, that's what I like more than winning by 20 points. And so with, with business, the fundamentals, you know, it's whatever. I'm just doing it so I can go enjoy passionate things, which is creating. I love to get ideas into the world. So that's that's much more closely related to business and personal branding. But also I just love to travel. I love to eat good food with good people. I love to go dance salsa and go hang out and like, uh, you know, listen to great music. I love to drink tequila. Those things for some reason I'm passionate about. So um, I think it's important to have that whether especially in life, right? That's going to be the North star that you usually go to in business. I think it's important to find at least a golden thread or a strand of something you're passionate about. Everything I'm doing is optimizing towards creating more. So when people talk about spending less time on Twitter and more time on business, I'm starting to flip that. And I'm like, well, what if I just spent more time creating, you know, just look at it from a different perspective. And that question, as I optimize towards that, I become happier and I'm finding more passion. The passion and the business are now starting to kind of overlap, which I've never experienced before. So that's what's going to unlock consistency more than anything else. And as Greg, you and I both know, it's like the consistency is what's going to win this game. And it's not consistency over the next few months. It's like, if, if you had to do this for the next 10 years, would you be okay with it? Yeah, you've been very consistent since you got on X. You started, I don't know if you know this, your first tweet was actually January 1st of this year. Oh. And it said, the best strategy in quotes, nine times out of 10 is never the optimal strategy. So do you remember that tweet? And can you unpack it a little bit? What advice do you have for people that are looking to build the best strategy? Oh man, I this is a blast from the past. I I don't remember that tweet, but I clearly understand what I'm saying there. It's best versus optimal. So the language we use kind of shapes and determines our reality. And I think people are a little bit unclear with their languages and their definitions, the word best being an issue. So in my time, we hear it all the time. Hey, what's the best platform, this or that? What's the best content calendar, this or that? Uh, you know, Should I do this? Should I do that? Questions like that. <clears throat> Those are all the wrong questions because what does the best mean? The best it, it, in and of itself doesn't hold any value or any direction. What matters is what I call optimal. What is the most optimal strategy? Now, this this reveals that there's certain context needed, like optimal for what? It, it goes deeper. Like, what are we building this on? It's this idea of closer versus more. Most people, our human brain biases more. It's like, I want more sales. I want more revenue. I want more followers. But what people don't understand is more doesn't necessarily make you more successful and it definitely doesn't make you happier. There are many cases where a seven figure business will make someone less happy than a six figure business, right? More revenue could make you more stressed than less revenue, more followers. And I've seen this behind the scenes, more followers doesn't make you more fulfilled than less followers, especially when you break past a certain point. What people need to do is they need to optimize for closer. And that means what's the target? What's the end point? What are we really working towards? More is just 
you can go off in any direction, but closer is like, I'm, I'm there's, there's an end point and I'm getting, I'm getting towards that. So the optimal strategy brings you closer to what truly matters. You don't need more things. You just need to get closer. That's what that tweet means. I love it. And I'm, I'm excited to watch you figure out your optimal strategy as you kind of enter into this new phase of your life and your business and the authority that you've been able to build so quickly on the platform, the respect you have from a lot of powerful people and just watching the way you write, the way you operate, the way you speak, the way you execute. It's been super inspiring for me, bro. I love everything you're doing. I'm honored to call you a friend. I can't wait until you come to Arizona next month and we get to hang out in person, maybe go salsa dancing. You could teach me a thing or two. Uh, I probably won't dance with you, but maybe you should, maybe, who knows? <laughs> um, I wanna thank you for coming on the show, brother. And uh, you know, roll out the red carpet here. And if you have anything you wanna promote, I know you're at The Sam Ocean on X, you've got the Creator Decoded newsletter. If there's anything else you wanna share or maybe just leave people with some inspiration and some encouragement. Got it. I, you know, I don't need to promote any of my stuff. People will find it, right? Uh, what I do like to do is just like how you had sent some amazing words about me. I share the same sentiment to you, man. I mean it when I say when I start doing these spaces, I did my first one and I would call it a smashing success. <clears throat> a lot of that was inspired by watching what you do. So when I say that what you're doing is something I am watching and I'm truly excited by, and I think there's, there's so many use cases for what you're teaching and what you're doing. Uh, I'm like, man, how, I'm taking notes. How can I do this for myself? So thank you. Thank you for having me on here. You are one of the coolest guys I've met on X. Cool in the literal definition of that word, like what we used to use when we were kids. Like, oh, he's so cool. That's you, man. And so I'm honored to call you a friend too. And uh, can't wait to see you, man. Sam, appreciate it, brother. We'll talk soon. See ya.